even brands like Maserati need a smaller SUV these days, and this is their attempt at it. It's the Grecale, and I'm going to tell you all about it in this review. If you've already subscribed, thank you. I love you. And if you haven't, why not? I'm giving you free reviews at least twice a week. Please do. Please join the community. Have your say in the comments section. Hit like, subscribe, and ring the bell so you stay up to date with everything I've got coming. Like I said, lots of reviews on their way for free. It's a Maserati, so it's not cheap, but it is one of the most affordable Maseratis in a long time. The entry-level version, which is this one here, it's called the GT, and it starts at $109,500 before on-road costs. And this one here is optioned up with a bunch of extras that make it $130-ish thousand dollars. And that extensive options list is expensive. Some of the options, including a few different paint options, are $50,000. Yeah, you heard that right. Now, when it comes to standard equipment, this version does come extensively equipped even at the base level, including LED lighting around the car. You get 19-inch alloy wheels with good tires. The ones on this car are optional 20-inch wheels. And on the inside, you've got this beautiful interior trim. It's called Maglia Milano trim, and it looks fantastic. And you've also got a leather-lined steering wheel, as you would expect. There's dual-zone climate control, heated front seats, electric front seat adjustment, and sat nav as you would expect apple carplay android auto there's a touch screen or two uh, that i'll get to in the interior section and a nice big digital instrument cluster as well it looks fantastic on the inside i reckon for the money that you're paying although this one does have a few options boxes ticked as well and if you want more then the next step up from here is called the moderna and it will set you back well quite a few thousand dollars more but you're getting more power and a more sporty intent from that version but if you want the sportiest version of the Grecale, then you need to choose the Trofeo version, which comes with a twin turbocharged petrol V6, and it'll do 0 to 100 in the three second range. It is mentally fast. Now, it obviously has a much higher price tag, but it puts it in a different sort of echelon when it comes to this medium sized SUV performance grade. So yeah, tell me which one you would pick in the comments. There are a bunch of really, really good compact SUVs that are sporty and luxurious at this kind of money. Now, I would say that the Porsche Macan is the obvious alternative, but I wouldn't necessarily say that the four-cylinder versions of the Macan are the best you can get. I would opt for a six if you can afford it, but it is a fantastic SUV if you buy a six. Another option you might want to consider is a more conventional choice, the BMW X3 M40i. It is an absolute killer, that car. Well, not a literal killer, thankfully. It's a really nice car, super luxurious, sporty to drive as well. And if you don't like X3 shape, then you can get an X4. But that'd be weird. Another option that you also might want to consider, which is Italian and an SUV that's small, but not necessarily a luxury SUV, is the Alfa Romeo Tonale. Now, that car is all new to the market, costs less than half the price of this car, and obviously it's a fair bit smaller, not quite as plush, but hey, if Italian and SUV is what you're after, and you want small, buy a Tonale. It might be the smallest Maserati that you can buy, but it's not a small car. It's not a small SUV. In fact, it's a mid-sizer, and it's even pretty big for a mid-size SUV. At just over 4.8 meters long. This is a pretty large car still, although the point of it is that it's a bit bigger than a Macan, but still a fair bit smaller than the Levante that sits above it, which is much more expensive, also much bigger. Now, I'll show you the back seat space in a sec, but first, let's check out the boot. This isn't a small SUV, so as you would expect, the boot space is pretty big. You've got 535 litres of cargo capacity to play with, which is pretty good for this size of SUV, but not class leading by any stretch of the imagination. Now, when it comes to the practicality in the boot, you've got some really clever things like elasticated straps on the side. So if you have a bottle of milk or something like that, it won't go flying around in the back. And there's also a 12 volt port up here and remote releases for the seat backs if you need to fold it down. It's a 40-20-40 arrangement. So that does add a little bit of practicality. If you go skiing, then you can fold down that middle section and load your skis through. Just make sure they are secure. Now, under the boot floor, you will find a tire repair kit. There is no spare tire, and that might be a deal breaker for you. It just depends on what you expect from your sporty SUV. 
This car feels a lot like a luxury SUV on the inside. Of course, it is a luxury SUV, a sporty luxury SUV, but it does have a few nice touches in here that will make you go, wow, Maserati's come a long way in terms of interior stuff. The brand has had a bit of an issue with its interiors over the years in terms of them not really feeling like the money that you're paying. But these days, yeah, it's a bit more of a high-tech experience than some of the other older Maseratis. Let's talk about these screens. You've got this big digital instrument cluster in front of the driver. Uh, next to it, down here, is your media control screen. Now that has all the stuff you would expect, your phone, your sat nav, your music, that sort of stuff, runs through this screen at the top. You can also check on your car's settings and stuff like that. Below there, you've got your gear selector buttons. Yep, buttons for gear selectors. So you've got drive, neutral, reverse, and park. It does take a bit of getting used to. Um, trust me, I've spent a few days with this car now and I'm still not used to it. Um, and below that, you'll find your climate control and other car controls. So it's another touch screen. I don't love that because I've bumped things on this screen, particularly like the air conditioning controls while I've been shifting between gears when parking and that sort of thing. So that's not fantastic. Um, you'll also find your headlights controls are down there. They're not a stalk anymore, although there is a high beam stalk. Um, so yeah, the screens, it will take some learning and hopefully you've got um, less big meat claws than I do and you don't bump things all the time because otherwise that could be really, really annoying. One other little screen though is up here, the clock, right? So there's adjustments you can make to the clock so you can change the face of the clock depending on what you want it to look like. You can also change it to be a compass or pedals. So that's actually can tell whether it's braking or accelerating depending on what you're doing or a G-force meter, um, which obviously leads to the idea that this is a pretty sporty SUV. And when it comes to these materials, okay, you've got this lovely stitch finish up on the dashboard, a nice stitching across the dash as well in front of the passenger. Um, these seats, they are beautiful to look at. They are very hard though. I've spent several hours in this car now and some long road trips as well. And I've found that the seat backrest is quite hard. And if you suffer from a sore back often, then you might want to ask if you can take the car for a pretty long test drive if you are considering it, because it might actually be a bit of an issue for you. So then you've also got a leather line steering wheel. Over here is where you'll see the start button for the engine. You've got drive mode selectors here and all the controls for the digital instrument display and some media controls are on this steering wheel as well. If you're looking at this wheel wondering where the volume control is, it's actually behind on this side, like Jeeps. Funny that. When it comes to the storage in here, wireless phone charger, you've got a little pop-up section here for storage. Your USB ports are in there for Apple CarPlay and Android Auto as well, although it is also available as wireless. You've also got a pair of cup holders here and a nice big center console bin in here with a 12 volt too. Glove box, bottle holders in the doors, Speaking of the doors, a couple of things to call out. It's got a 14 speaker stereo system. It's by Sonus Faber. Um, if you haven't heard of them, they are like very high end audio and the stereo system is fantastic in this car. Now, another thing about the doors, no door handles, right? Well, there are, there's two actually, two different sets of door handles. One of them is a button, which you press and another one down below is in case that system doesn't work. Nice backup. So, there you go. I love the sound of these doors too. They have a really, really solid thunk, and I love that. Anyway, back seat, let's check it out. This seat is set for me at 182 centimeters or six foot. I've got heaps of room back here, lots of knee room, lots of foot room, heaps of headroom. It is very accommodating, though I would say it's gonna be more comfortable for two people in the back rather than three, because, well, the seats are very sculpted, Anyone in the middle isn't going to be that comfortable. And also there's quite a big transmission tunnel intrusion. Also these directional air vents, uh, that console area does eat into the space if you were to put three across the back. So I wouldn't recommend that, but if you need to, it will be okay. As I mentioned, vents there. There's also a couple of USB ports down below. And you'll also see in the outboard seats, you've got ISO fix points and three top tethers as well. There's good storage. You've got a couple of little I guess you'd call them nooks on the backs of the seats. Um, you could put 
you know, loose items in there, your phone maybe. Uh, there's also a couple of cup holders in this fold down section with a storage bit for a device or something like that. And like I mentioned, you can flip this seat down separately if you need it as a ski port. There's also bottle holders in the doors and it's gonna be pretty much accommodating enough for a family of four or a couple who likes a luxury SUV. Yeah. Okay, so there are three different powertrain options available, although two of them are very similar. There's just a bit of tweaking going on between them. The entry level version, which is this one here, has a two liter turbocharged four cylinder engine with 48 volt mild hybrid technology to give it an extra boost and also help it run more efficiently. I'll tell you more about that in the efficiency section. Now, it comes with a fair amount of power and torque. For the entry-level version, this is plenty punchy. And then if you step up from here into the Modena, well, you still get the same engine, but it's been tickled for a bit of extra power, same amount of torque. It does mean that the 0 to 100 time is a bit more aggressive though. And as I mentioned, at the top of the range is the Trofeo with the three liter twin turbo V6 petrol engine, the same engine that they use in the MC20 sports car, and it offers sports car-like performance. Obviously, you're looking at a 3.8 second 0 to 100 time, and it can do 0 to 200 in some crazy amount of time as well. I'll put it on screen. And if you're wondering, all of them come with an eight speed automatic transmission and all of them are all wheel drive. Push the button to go into drive and away we go. Yes, that does take a little bit of getting used to people. Um, I haven't loved it and I have been going for the phantom shifter on the edge of the steering wheel. Maybe that makes me think that it's more like a Mercedes-Benz than any other vehicle that I've driven. And that is a pretty nice compliment, right? So let me tell you, my first impression in this car was, well, it's kind of noisy. Well, mainly the engine is kind of noisy. Uh, it's a four cylinder, like I mentioned, mild hybrid with 48 volt technology. So it does have a bit of assistance every now and then. But when I first accelerated, I was like, oh, there's a bit more noise than I was expecting there to be. I don't know why I was expecting it maybe to be a bit quieter. It is a Maserati after all. They're all about how much noise you can make and how annoying you can be with the exhaust. I don't know why I was expecting necessarily a really quiet car, but um, Maserati does have a bit of a reputation for having pretty vocal vehicles. And this car is a bit louder than you might expect. But you do get used to it, and it's a pretty nice noise. I think actually that it's nicer than some of the other four-cylinder luxury-ish SUVs out there. So it's also a fantastic engine. Like, I've really enjoyed the acceleration on offer. It just picks up and goes, and it's quick, like properly quick. It's also usable power. So if you are just cruising around town and you need to squeeze through a gap in traffic, you'll be able to do it. If you're overtaking on the freeway, no hassles whatsoever. This is a very, very usable powertrain. You can also hear just the slightest little bit of motor whine when it's assisting the engine, which is a really nice thing to hear. It makes it feel, well, high tech, but also raspy and enjoyable and characterful. I really like this powertrain. I also have no issues whatsoever with the eight speed automatic transmission. It seems to do a really good job in pretty much every single situation that I have driven this car in. It's known what to do. And I've done some hard driving and some very easy urban commuting style driving. Yep, no issues. I also have very little issue with the suspension and the steering. Um, it's pretty well sorted in terms of the comfort of the ride, even on the slightly bigger 20 inch wheels. Uh, it is a little bit firm, but it's a sporty SUV. So I think that's okay. And when it comes to the steering also, it has a nice amount of heft to it. It's very direct on center. So all you need to do is basically just move the steering wheel just a little bit and it changes direction which means that it is exciting to drive. It's also enticing. It makes you want to go and find a nice stretch of road, which I've done, and I liked it. I liked it a lot. There you have it. There's not a whole lot to complain about in the Maserati Gricale when it comes to the drive experience. In fact, this is one of the most surprising new car experiences I've had in a while. I'm impressed. 
Let's talk about efficiency then. So mild hybrid in this application doesn't necessarily mean prioritizing fuel consumption or fuel savings over power. So it isn't the most hybrid-like fuel consumption figure. The official number you'll see on your screen now, that's what you should be able to achieve across a mix of driving, and that's for this GT version. And now I'll show you the moderner version. Yeah, just a little bit higher. Now, if you fork out for the six-cylinder version, the Trofeo, well, it does have a fair bit higher fuel consumption figure. I haven't driven that car, so I can't comment on whether it's accurate, 11.2 litres per 100 Ks, but um, I imagine if it's anything like this car, it'll egg you on and make you want to drive a little bit quicker. And yeah, you might see 11.2 on a highway run, for instance, but yeah. Okay, so what did I see over a week of driving this car? You'll see that figure on your screen now. And again, impressed. This car is ticking some boxes when it comes to the drive. There is no applicable safety rating for this car just yet, but it does come as standard with a bunch of the technology that you would expect in 2023 and beyond, including autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist detection. There's also adaptive radar cruise control. You've got lane keeping assistance, active lane keeping technology as well. There's blind spot monitoring and rear cross traffic alert as standard as well. And like I mentioned, all versions come with a surround view camera, which is nice to see. There's front and rear parking sensors too. And when it comes to air Bag coverage you've got six dual front front side and full length curtain there is no front center airbag in this car which is a bit strange this brand is a bit behind the times when it comes to warranty cover it's three years and unlimited kilometers available for all their models but that's about two years behind the mainstream luxury brands out there now when it comes to servicing it's every 12 months or 20,000 kilometers which is very lengthy for a service interval i don't know whether i would be letting my hundred thousand dollar maserati run to 20,000 k's before getting it checked but you do you now you'll see on screen the service prices for both the four cylinder and six cylinder versions for that's a three year service pack. So 36 months, 60,000 kilometers of cover. And if you're wondering roadside assist details on your screen now. So yeah, what do you think? I've really liked spending some time in the Maserati Gricale. I think it is a fantastic option for those who are looking for something that isn't a Porsche Macan or one of those other more mainstream German brands, then this could be a fantastic choice. And it's probably the most impressive Maserati I've driven in years. But then again, I haven't driven that many Maseratis in the past few years. Now, tell me what you think in the comments section below. Do you like it? Would you choose it? Or would you choose something else? I'd love to know what you're thinking, please. Hit me up in the comments section with some comments and some thoughts and some love or hate mail. You know, hit me up. I'm easy, whatever. See you in the next one.